What's up everybody? This is Aaron from Aaron's Audio Corner and today I'm going to review the JBL HDI 3800 floor standing loudspeakers. Now in this review, I'm not going to get into the in-depth topical aspects about what makes these speakers so great because there's a lot of other reviews out there that do that. And frankly, I don't want to retread ground and waste your time and waste my time on something that's been done ad nauseum. I do, however, want to talk about what I heard when I listened to the speakers, and then I'll correlate that with you guys in terms of how the speakers measure using my Clipple near field scanner. So with that said, this video is going to be pretty long, just like all of my other videos, because there's a lot of ground to cover and all the things that I think are very important take some time to talk about. Therefore, if you only care about subjective or objective, make sure you check the tags below and go to the appropriate section for the chapters that you are interested in. A couple highlights that I do wanna mention just so you kinda of get a good foundation and understanding of what these speakers are. These speakers stand at about 45 inches tall. They're about 80 pounds. They were kind of heavy to move around in and out of my room and to the upstairs room as well. And also to put on the clipple stand, I had to get my wife to help me with that. So shout out to my wife. People always ask, what does your wife think about this stuff? Well, she helps me. So. There you go. Now, this speaker is the flagship model of the HDI series from JBL Synthesis line. This speaker is a two and a half way design, which means that instead of a traditional two way or three way where you have dedicated pass bands for each individual drive unit, this speaker has three eight inch midwoofers and the bottom two eight inch midwoofers only play up to a certain point, which is about 800 Hertz. And then the top midwoofer continues to play up to about 1.8 kilohertz where it matches with the compression driver tweeter. The benefit of this design is that you keep the center to center spacing between the tweeter and the midwoofer pretty low so as to reduce lobing effects, but you also get the added benefit of having additional SPL sensitivity via the two bottom woofers. The enclosure is very, very inert, no ringing, nothing like that that I could tell, nothing that showed up in the measurements that indicated that there was any kind of enclosure resonance at all. The design apparently is very well braced, although I haven't had a chance to look inside of it myself. Um, I might, in between this video portion and a later one, maybe take this thing apart and look around inside of it. But as far as I can tell, there is no reason to investigate it, if you want to call it that. Uh, very good design off the top. It does feature two flared ports in the back. And something worth noting there is that initially when I set these speakers up, I thought maybe there was some kind of resonance coming from the, from the rear ports. And I actually walked around to the backside, played a couple different tracks. I used a sound sweeper to go through and the ports were actually very silent. I didn't hear any noise or anything like that coming from the ports. So I will say that the ports are very quiet, which is what you want. And as I said, if you want to read more about it or hear other people's viewpoints about the technical design of this speaker, please do so. I'll try to drop a couple links and I'll definitely drop one to JBL's website directly. Let's talk about what I heard. Let's talk about the subjective. And for what it's worth, I always do my listening before I do my measurements because personally speaking, I know that if I saw the measurements first, then I would be biased by what I saw, even if I was trying not to be. Some things you just can't help but see in measurements and it makes you go, hmm, and it could bias you one way or the other. So if you see a semi-flat response, you go into it expecting you know, a good neutral sound, but if you see aberrations in the response and you go in, expecting to hear those or looking for those particularly. So I do all of my testing after I do my listening. And then that's when I do my note comparisons with the notes that I took during my subjective listening. So I've got on my phone some notes that I took and I'm gonna just walk through some of these notes and we'll talk about what I heard when I was sitting in the main listening position. Now, the main listening position was about four meters. I think I put here 3.9 meters from the speakers. The speakers, I actually moved a couple different times from the back wall, and ultimately I settled on, I think this says 1.2 meters from the back wall, and then I think I, I shifted that to like 1.1 meters, and I also tried even closer, and I also tried even a little bit further out, just trying to get an idea of how much interaction is there with this speaker and the wall behind the speaker, especially in terms of port, you know? So if you put the speaker too close to the wall and it has rear ports, then you will essentially choke off that port. Now, obviously I never went to that extreme, but I did put the speakers, you know, a couple feet away from the walls and I never noticed any real big significant issues with that. But I would still recommend that with most loudspeakers, you treat these the same way. 
you pull them about three feet from the wall, and that's what I did for the majority of my listening tests. And please note that you know all the, the subjective thoughts I'm giving are based on my in-room listening experience. So your room may differ, there may be some differences, but for the most part, I expect a lot of these things will translate pretty well, especially when we get to the data and start correlating that information. Now, Janet Jackson, Miss You Much. Uh, I noted that it had good punchy mid-bass, which is what's on the disc. Now, how do I know what's on the disc? Well, I ran the spectrum through Audacity, and I'll actually throw up an image right here. And as you can see, above about 70 hertz is where most of the meat of that song is, and below about 70 hertz is when the response starts to fall off, which means that when you have like a kick drum or something like that, usually that's in the 50 to 60 hertz region, and that gives you that real grunt of, a, of the mid-bass sound. But when I was listening to this track, I didn't really notice any grunt. But going back and looking at the actual spectrum of the song itself, you can see that there isn't any of that 50 to 60 hertz region, which explains why you just get that thump from the 70 hertz region, and then it just kind of carries on. So in terms of accuracy, I feel like these speakers are doing that job well. Uh, I noted that something sounded resonant in the two to 300 hertz region, and I wasn't quite sure what it was. Now, honestly, I thought maybe that it was going to be the ports. I thought, well, maybe there's some kind of resonance going on in the ports. And initially I thought it was the five to 600 Hertz region. So I, I blocked the ports and I listened again. And by blocking the ports, I just stuffed some uh, dish rags in the port. So don't tell anybody. Uh, but after I did that, you know, the issue didn't go away. It was still there and it just sounded a little bit uh, chesty, I guess, the lack of better words, in the two to 300 hertz region, which is mostly noticed in female vocals. I, I can't say that that wasn't the room, but I will say that, you know, moving the speakers, you know, a few feet forward, a few feet back, it didn't really seem to change that much, which leads me to believe that it could be the speakers themselves. And when we get in the data, we'll see if we can find any evidence of that. And we'll talk about that then. Uh, Joe Walsh. So Joe Walsh is uh, Rocky Mountain Way, which is a great song. It starts off with a left pan guitar, left, your left, yeah, left pan guitar, and then I think a right and then a center. But the thing about these speakers that I noticed and I didn't like, 100% you know, honesty here, is that when you have panned music, either left or right or even both at the same time, if it's mostly mid-range sound that's coming, you can actually hear that from the top woofer and the speaker doesn't act as a good point source from the tweeter to the top woofer. Looking back at the data, I think I understand why. So we're gonna talk about that in a little bit too. Um, a lot of people don't notice these kind of things, but being a car audio nerd, you know, one of the things that we have to judge for in car audio sound quality is the height of stage. And I'm really perceptive to issues when, when there's phase align misalignments, I should say, when there's phase misalignments between, you know, a tweeter and a door mid bass in somebody's car. And so those things are easier for me to pick up on. I, I can't say that other people would notice that, but it's definitely in the data. And I think it's cool to see that kind of information, something that's you know more rarely talked about in subjective terms, backed up and quantified by data. Toe in. These speakers being the horn type design that they are with a great lineage from the M2 design and, and going maybe even further back, Sometimes, you know, you want to tow in a horn desired speaker and you get that time level and intensity trading, which means that, you know, if you point the speakers crossways instead of, you know, on axis to you or a little bit towed off, if you actually turn them where their, their paths are, are crossing, crossing the streams, right, Ghostbuster reference, at maybe a few feet in front of you, what that does is that allows you to sit in different locations and still get a good stereo image. It's not going to be perfect, but it's still relatively good because a speaker like this has a good constant and controlled directivity above, I think, about 800 hertz or so. I'm going to have to go back and look at the data to, to know that for sure. But I got to say in this case that I didn't, I didn't feel like there was any benefit in towing the speakers in too much or even out. I actually like them more on axis, and when I towed them out, I felt like the high frequency tended to suffer more than I personally cared for. Now, looking at the data, there is a, a peaky response above, uh, above 10 kilohertz. I think it starts around 16K and goes up to 20. And it's about a plus five dB bump there, but I don't think that the majority of people are really gonna notice that. And I say that because you may look at the data and you may think, well, you wanna turn them off axis a little bit so you don't have that high frequency bump. 
But what I'm telling you is that I would not do that because then the eight kilohertz region and up starts to fall off more than I would personally care for. The soundstage, so for these particular speakers, I didn't find the soundstage to be as wide as I did the Revel F226BE, which this is also backed up in the data, and we'll talk about that shortly. And I say that, you know, the soundstage is, is wide, but it's not as wide. It gets to about plus or minus 50 degrees horizontally, um, whereas some of the other speakers I've tested are about plus or minus 70 degrees. And if you watch my KEF R3 review, which I'll put up here somewhere, uh, I talk about that a little bit, about how I personally prefer a wider soundstage because it gets more room interaction with the walls and the boundaries and provides you that apparent source width that makes you think there's more width in a recording than maybe there really is. And that is 100% preference. That's There's no right or wrong way to do that. That's 100% preference and it's something that I care for more. And these particular speakers, they didn't seem to do that as well as I would hope. But that's one of the trade-offs of a design like this where they control directivity and help to tighten up the response laterally. Another thing I, I didn't necessarily care for was I felt like the roll-off on these speakers was a little bit too fast. Uh, with triple eights, you know, you expected more low frequency output, but it seems to be that JBL and Revel roll off the speakers a little bit more quickly than I would personally care for and than I honestly would expect. So. That's a design attribute that seems to be part of the Harman wheelhouse. Uh, and I may be incorrect about my assumptions there, but based on the data and based on what I've heard, that's generally the trend that I'm seeing. So with that said, if you're talking about ultra low frequency, and I'm gonna say below about 40 Hertz or so, you're, you're still gonna want a subwoofer. Now, if you're using these for strictly music and you put them in a room, you get some room gain, you get some boundary reinforcement, and that will help bring up that lower octave. So it feels like I'm kind of harping on these speakers. Let me talk about some of the positives here. I really like these in a movie type setting. So I actually watched the Zack Snyder's Justice League. And if you guys haven't seen that, I recommend it, especially if you are a big DC fan and you watch the other DC movies and you thought they were hot garbage. This one mostly makes up for all of that. So I recommend that movie. But anyway, I watched that movie and I watched some TV in, in my living room with these speakers and I really had no complaints. They're very, very dynamic. And by dynamic, I mean the ability to play loud and soft or, or soft to loud very quickly. And I think that is an attribute to the sensitivity because that means the amplifier isn't having to provide as much power output as it normally would with like a, a standard bookshelf in the 85 or 86 dB sensitivity range because these are closer to 90 dB sensitivity ranking. I think my favorite thing about these speakers though is that they flat out hammer, like hammer. If you watch any of my other reviews, you know that I like to listen to music pretty loudly. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I'm a loud junkie. You know, what, what can I say? And a lot of the times speakers just simply don't have enough for me to be satisfied with the output or, you know, you're running it to the ragged edge and you can hear speakers flopping around or it's very high distortion. But with these speakers, I had them at 105 dB at my listening position. And that's all I could take because I thought, you know, at some point I was probably going to lose my hearing. 105 dB at four meters is really loud and that's full range. So that's not like using a high pass to protect the mid bass on these speakers. That's running full range. There was no chuffing, no port noise of any sort, no resonance from the enclosure, no uh, mid bass flopping around because they're just being hit too hard. Nothing like that, no sharpness in the treble, which is typical to have when you have a standard tweeter because you start encroaching upon that really high distortion region. I didn't notice any of that in these speakers at all. They just flat out hammer. So if you're like a home theater junkie, and you wanna pair these with some big old 18s or some 15s or something like that, my Lord, they will get down. And if you had the means to use three of them for left, center, right, and behind like an acoustically uh, transparent screen, yeah, do that. Cause I did it upstairs just for kicks and I didn't take any pictures because it's a huge pain. If, if my movie room moving stuff around is a huge pain, but I did it just to try it using these two and the uh, JBL HDI, 4500 center channel that I'll be reviewing soon. And when I get it done, I'll put it here. But when I did that, dude, it's like crazy loud. And I'm running JBL Pro high sensitivity drivers that I DIY'd and they're ran fully active. And that, that setup upstairs right now will get crazy loud. But this setup with these two and that uh, center channel, it's crazy, crazy loud. So in terms of output, these absolutely do it. I mean, they 
peg the meters. And it's, uh, I mean, I shouldn't be telling people, yeah, go out and, and bloody your ears up by listening to high volume, but come on, man. If you're, if you're doing, if you're doing a speaker like this, you're going to crank it up. You're expecting to crank it up, right? And, and the question is, how loud will they go? Well, 105 dB at four meters. And I was like, okay, I got to take a break here. So they do it and they do it fine without any hint of distortion or mechanical noise. That's a huge thumbs up for me in that regard. And in terms of power right now, I've got a Parasound integrated 200, which is about 110 watts at four ohm and eight ohm. And I had no issues whatsoever with power in the speaker. And like I said, it got to 105 dB at four meters listening distance. And that was kind of getting to the upper limits of the output volume from the Parasound. But, you know, to be able to get that loud with a small little integrated amplifier. Yeah, so if you've got a big boy amp, I'm sure it's gonna sound fantastic. That's the end of my subjective notes. Now I'm gonna jump into the objective and let's talk about the data, you know, how it correlates what I heard and some things regarding positioning and where you should be sitting relative to the speakers to get the best sound from these. Okay, we are at my website, which is aaronsaudiocorner.com and I will leave a link to it below in the description. And we're gonna kinda of get through some of this and I took some specifications from the JBO website just to help people you know, save a little bit of time. And the things I wanna note here really are just the crossover frequency of 800 hertz and 1800 hertz because that's gonna come into play when we start looking at the data. Some pictures that I took, if you wanna check those out. Now for all my measurements, I use the Klippel Near Field Scanner. It is a great way of allowing you to get anechoic data from a non-anechoic room. And actually, I have my near field scanner set up in my garage. It's really cool. If you want to hear more about that and try to understand, you know, what's going into the near field scanner, you can check out my video interview that I did with Christian Bellman, who is one of the designers of the near field scanner. Okay, and keep going down here. Now, this is the first set of data that we're going to get to. And before I look at the data, let me note that the reference plane in this test is at the tweeter. The speaker was tested in ported configuration and the port was not sealed. All testing in this review was done without the grill. Measurements are in accordance with the CTA 2034 standard. If you want to check out the standard, you can find that in this link right here. Just click that and follow it and then you can do a free download for it. Now, this graphic is the CEA or CTA 2034 measurement set. The black is the on axis, the listening window is in the green dashed, and that is a plus or minus 30 degree horizontal average as well with a plus or minus 10 degree vertical. The two dash blue line is the early reflections, so those are the primary reflections. Mainly it's the front hemisphere and a little bit of the rear hemisphere. And then the sound power is all 360 degrees vertically and vertically and horizontally as well. And then we have sound power directivity index and early reflections directivity index. And, and these two are down here. The rest of all of them are up here. And if you want to understand, you know, what goes into these different equations and stuff, you can find the information right here. Just click the little down arrow and do that. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm just going to talk about a few things here that I see. Black on axis, what we see going from the low end is that there is a, in my opinion, it seems rather steep or it's certainly higher in frequency than I would have expected it to be, as I mentioned previously, roll off. And that roll off starts at around the 60 hertz region. And then I think the F3 point is around 50 hertz or so, give or take. Uh, and I'm basing the F3 upon an average sensitivity that I've measured of 89 dB, just kind of eyeball on this line. It could be 89 point something, but it's around 89 dB, give or take. Uh, then the next set of things that I kind of find interesting are these uh, little wiggles in the line. Now, um, a lot of people, when they do measurements, they aren't performing them in an anechoic chamber or with a near field scanner. And the quasi anechoic measurements that are available to users, I mean, same thing I used to use, is limited in resolution. So typically your resolution is 300 hertz increments or so. And that means that you've got a good data point every 300 hertz, whereas anechoic data has resolution down to, you know, two, maybe even one hertz, five hertz on the higher end. So you've got a lot more um, finer resolution for looking at internal resonances. Otherwise, you wouldn't see, you know, resonances show up in the mid range with a quasi anechoic measurement. And that's the great thing about having anechoic measurements because those kind of things 
are very audible, uh, especially, you know, if they're broader in terms of the frequency band that they cover. If they're a single little spike goes up and comes back down really quick, then it's not as noticeable. But if it's broad, then you're going to notice it. And if it's high in amplitude, then you're going to notice it as well. So I say that to say this, that I'm noticing some areas that kind of indicate that they could be resonances in the off axis response, which again, looking back at the listening window, early reflections, sound power. And when you're talking about that set of data, so everything in the top portion except for the black, what you ideally want is some kind of, not gonna be the same as the black, but it should kind of follow it within reason. And I say within reason to mean that if you've got a speaker that is frontward firing, then obviously there's not gonna be a lot of high frequency content going to the back. So you expect to see high frequency content start to roll off on this sound power line here. The early reflections that I mentioned previously is mostly front hemisphere with a few from the rear hemisphere. So that same kind of thing plays in here. But if you're talking about is an overall thing, you're kind of just eyeballing this stuff and looking. And I would say that, you know, the listening window, which is the dash green, follows really well with the on axis response, except for this eight kilohertz region, you kind of see a discrepancy here. And the early reflections and sound power follow the on axis response as well. So I think in general, the radiation pattern of this speaker shows to be pretty consistent. But I do want to note some areas that, you know, I, I kind of find a little bit interesting. I find the issues shown in this data are more easily seen in the directivity indices measurements. So these bottom ones down here. Now, the blue is the early reflections compared to the listening window. So this blue down here is a comparison of this blue and this green. And then the same thing kind of goes for this red down here. This red down here is this red and this green. Okay, Christmas colors, red and green, sweet. Um, anyway, sorry, sidetracked myself here. I'm going to focus on the early reflections directivity index for now because sound power directivity is, is everything in the room. And when you start talking about high frequency, I'm not as concerned with sound power. I'm more concerned with the early reflections directivity and somebody else may have a different opinion. That's fine. So this is why the data is here. Generally, if you have a full omnidirectional speaker, what you're going to have is a early reflections directivity or a sound power directivity that would be flat. It would just be zero flat line across, you know, a reference point of zero. But since this is not an omnidirectional speaker, you're going to see that as you go higher in frequency, there's going to be more of a line going up higher in frequency from the low frequency region. And what we really want to check and see is in that eyeballed line and that kind of trend line, so to speak, is there a deviation? And so if I'm just going to say from 100 hertz up to this point up here at 20 kilohertz, is there a deviation? Well, yeah, we can see a couple. Uh, you see the first deviation around 300 hertz, this little dip right here. What we can see here is that the speaker is omnidirectional at very low frequencies. And then as it goes higher in frequency, it's becoming more directional. And at a certain point, it hits this 300 hertz region, it becomes more omnidirectional again, which kind of indicates to me that there maybe is a resonance, something's lighting up, or that could be contribution from the port because the port's on the back. And then you go more directional as you go higher in frequency, and then you go omnidirectional again. But why do you go omnidirectional again? Well, remember, 800 hertz is where the crossover is between the two bottom woofers and the top mid woofer, okay? And that means that the two bottom woofers are no longer causing the speaker to radiate more narrowly. And when you do that, you go back to an omnidirectional pattern, but that eight inch speaker also begins to narrow up on its own. So that top eight inch woofer, now as you get above a thousand Hertz, is becoming more directional. Now they've introduced at 1.8 kilohertz, the tweeter. So now you're, when you went from directional, now you're going more omnidirectional again. And then the tweeter itself is, as you can see, pretty, pretty good. I mean, it, it doesn't increase sharply, in directivity, which means that it has a pretty wide radiation pattern on its own in the mostly front hemisphere. Early reflections. Now this is this blue right here. So all of this is just the breakouts, individual components of the early reflections. So there's floor, sidewall bounce, ceiling bounce, front wall bounce, etc, etc, etc. And if you want to read more about what makes those up, then you can do that here. It has all the definitions right here ready to go for you. Just click that down arrow and there you go. The thing that stands out to me here is the total air reflection has a dip in the one to two kilohertz region. And it looks like it's being driven by the floor bounce. You can see this dip here. 
as well as the ceiling bounce. So it seems the floor and the ceiling are really kicking your butt here, but the side walls aren't really causing you any major detriment in this particular case. So interesting to note. How would you fix that? Well, you could add acoustic absorption, you know, to the floor and the ceiling, but you're not going to put, you know, four inch panels on the floor or on the ceiling. I mean, you might, but the other thing to note too, is that when you do something like that, you're adding broadband absorption. So if you try to absorb, you know, one to two kilohertz, you're going to need something thick. And that also means that other high frequencies are going to be absorbed the same way. Now, the good benefit there is when you're talking about vertical response, the vertical response is much more limited than the horizontal response, but there's always that trade-off. So if you've got a wide vertical response and you're absorbing a lot of it, then you're going to have a discontinuity there as well. So it really is all about how the speaker is designed. And that's why this data is helpful. As we get further into it, you'll understand what I mean. Estimated in-room response. Now, I'm going to talk more about this later, but the really cool thing about anechoic data is that you can take all of it and you can form an estimation for how the speaker is going to sound in a particular room or in a generic room, I guess I should say. And if you want to know what the definition for this really is, and you can click this down arrow, but what I'm telling you is essentially that we'll come back to it shortly. Now this is the SPL horizontal. And the one thing that you want to take away from this is just what's the trend line off axis compared to on axis. I mean, if you get caught up and look at the individual lines, you're going to be here all day, but you just kind of want to check the trends. Are the trends following each other? You know, are there any aberrations or anything that stand out? You know, is it off axis, you know, more than the on axis response? Because if it is, and that's a sign that there's something going on somewhere. And when the off axis response does not mimic, mimic is the key word here the on-axis response, that means that reflections are going to have a detriment to the sound. They're going to be different from what you hear first, and they're going to cause the timbre to be off from the original sound. And it just kind of mucks up, you know, the overall tonality of things, and it can affect the sound stage as well. Uh, the only thing that I'm seeing here that really kind of stands out to me, again, I'm harping on this 300 because this is what I heard when I listened. And you see that it's all kind of bunching up together right here. Something's going on there. So I, again, I don't know if that's a contribution from the rear ports also helping kind of wrap around and give that full 360 degree sound or if there's a resonance there. I'm just not sure, but I'm pretty sure this is what I was hearing when I made that note earlier about hearing something that two to 300 hertz region. Uh, same thing, SPL vertical. Now, speakers are always going to behave different vertically than they are horizontally unless it's a concentric driver. I mean, that's just kind of the nature of the beast here. The thing that I'm looking at here and noticing that there is a pretty significant uh, dip in response as you go above the tweeter line. So stay away from above the tweeter line. You can come back and look at this if you want to later. I'm going to focus on this measurement. This measurement is the horizontal contour plot. Now this is all the off axis measurements and the on axis measurements just laid out and kind of squished together into a rectangle. That's what you got here. Zero is the tweeter axis. And then plus or minus 180 degrees is how far out this goes. So what we can see here is that the speaker is radiating 360 degrees around in the low frequencies. And as you go to higher frequencies, it's narrowing up its, um, its waveform. But the thing that, again, I'm noticing, I'm going to keep coming back to this, notice the radiation pattern increases from, or actually decreases from omnidirectional 100 hertz to about plus or minus 60 at 200 hertz increases to about plus or minus 100 at 300 hertz and then decreases immediately again at about 350 hertz to about plus or minus 60 degrees and i'm pretty certain that's what i was hearing and then the same thing kind of goes vertically as well the key takeaway here in the vertical contour plot notice all the energy so let's let's go back here zero degrees is the on-axis response so looking at the tweeter and then this is going below the speaker this is going above the speaker. So the plus is above the speaker. So let's say high frequency, you know, we're out here, we're at the zero degree line, all the high frequencies kind of line up. You see all the energy is focused around plus or minus, I don't know, maybe 20 hertz or, or 20 degrees, you know, give or take. But when you go lower in frequency, notice all the red energy is going below the speaker, okay? This is what I was noticing when I made the comment about the Joe Walsh track. And, and I just now, not just now, but I saw the data after I heard that. And seeing this in the data, I was like, okay, that explains what I was hearing. All the SPL, not all the SPL, but the majority of the SPL being radiated from the speaker below, you know, one kilohertz is from below the tweeter line. 
And that is what created that discontinuity again in the height from the tweeter, and the listening axis, to the mid-woofer. That's why I heard the majority of the mid-range coming from the mid-woofer. And it's just something that's worth noting. You know, I think it's neat to see it show up in the data. Now, some phase and impedance plots. So what we see here is the phase is in red, and then the impedance is in blue, and then the effective, what is this? Equivalent peak dissipation resistance. So EPDR, this is new to me. I mean, I just discovered this like a couple months ago. So I've integrated it into my data set because better to do it now than to try to come back and do it months from now when I actually understand it because there's a lot of people out there who do understand it better than I do. My takeaway from it so far is that it's, it's not necessarily saying that, you know, right now I'm showing a purple line at 2 ohm. It's not saying that the speaker is 2 ohm. It's, it's kind of saying that that's what the amplifier sees at that frequency. But for the most part, this, this speaker is, you know, the 3 ohm or more region. And it wasn't a problem for my uh, Parasound integrated 200 to drive. And that's rated at 110 watts at 4 ohm or 8 ohm. Uh, no issues driving it with that. And I don't know that you would have any issues driving it with a standard, you know, AVR type receiver. In general, I would say if your AVR is rated for 4 ohms, you're probably okay. Harmonic distortion, this is where the speaker really, really shines. So this speaker can get loud with very low distortion. And I'm going to skip straight to the 100 dB at 1 meter mark. Negative 40 dB fundamental or relative to the fundamental is about 1% THD. So for the most part, the speaker is around 1% THD or below, um, except for a few places. You know, you obviously on the lower end, you, you increase THD as you go toward the lower frequencies. And up around the tweeter crossover region where the tweeters get more power, that increases. But this is still all below about 3%. So overall, at 100 dB, this, this speaker is pretty darn good on distortion. And then glow plots. This is a more intuitive way for me to look at, you know, the normalized contour plots, the pretty plots that we looked at above. It's just a different way of looking at it. So instead of a squished rectangle, it's a full 360 degree, uh, not really a glow, but I guess a... A polar plot, if you want to call it that. I actually want to call it here in the title. So, sweet. Uh, zero degrees is looking forward to the speaker. This is looking back, plus or minus 90 to the side. And you're looking top down to get the horizontal dispersion pattern of the speaker. And I do this because it's more intuitive for me to view it this way. So I can tell just by looking at this very quickly. Plus or minus 50 degrees for the speaker. And there is extra energy at 320 hertz being radiated toward the back. Then there's not, and then there is again, and five to 800 hertz, there's a good bit of extra energy radiated directly to the back. So I'm thinking these are port contributions because that's the only thing that makes sense to me, but it could be something else. I don't know. Uh, now we'll go on and look at the vertical version of this, and this is zero degrees. So this is your tweeter line looking this way to the right. Uh, the back of the speaker is to the left. Down is negative 90 degrees, and up is positive 90 degrees. So what I'm seeing here is the same thing that we saw in the vertical plot earlier, where you have more SPL at lower frequencies below the tweeter line. And then above the tweeter line at the crossover region, you've got a bit more SPL at about the two kilohertz region. And from this, again, you can kind of presume that, yeah, zero degrees tweeter line where I measured, that's probably the ideal location. You might possibly want to go down to the negative 10 degrees, somewhere in that window, but I wouldn't exceed that either way up or down. I would stay within, you know, zero to negative 10 degrees for the listening vertical position. And then directivity balloon. This is another way to look at the radiation of the speaker, but this is more of a true globe. This is a sphere of the response. And I primarily do this to see, you know, how the radiation pattern is changing as you get near the crossover. Is it turning into a lobe like we just saw? So 1.8 kilohertz is the crossover region for the mid-woofer for the top mid-woofer to the tweeter and you can see there is some lobing effect right now so there's a lobe right there and a little bit more coming off the bottom of the speakers this is really useful information i think when you pair it up to all these other graphics that i provided you can really get a lot of insight to what the speaker's radiation pattern is now this is where it all comes together the in-room measurements from the listening position i talked about the prediction based off the anechoic data that is in the black line. And then the teal line is the actual in-room response measured at my couch. And above about 500 hertz, you can see that the teal line follows the black line almost perfectly. And then below that, you have more room interactions, room modes, couch, chair, uh, maybe a passing dog, a running child, <laughs> you know, just the stuff that you deal with in daily life. 
that's going to show up in the measurements. That's going to corrupt the measurements. Well, not really corrupt the measurements, but that's going to corrupt the um, response in a room. I mean, the room is primarily the driver of the response below about 500 hertz. And that frequency kind of depends on the size of the room and, you know, some of the furnishings and stuff. But in general, it's four to 500 hertz for most rooms. Above that, though, you can see the prediction works really, really, really well. Why am I hyping this up? Because it's a great thing to have. If I can tell you what a speaker is most likely going to do in your room, why wouldn't you want to know that? If I can tell you that for a bunch of different speakers and you happen to have experience with one of those speakers, then you have a reference point. You can look at the data and you can remember how that speaker sounded in your room. And then you can look at other speakers' data and say, okay, I, I kind of have an idea of what that sounded like. So I can infer from this data set that this speaker is probably going to perform like this in my room. And it's a great thing to have. It, it increases your knowledge by a large margin and helps you become a better shopper. And that's great. It takes the guesswork out of things too. Uh, parting random thoughts, and this is just, you know, a lot of what I mentioned previously, but I do note that I forgot to mention the imaging and focusing of the speaker. So when you have a soundstage, that's just like the, the sphere of sound from radiated from speakers, you know, and that's supposed to be whatever is in the recording. So if the recording had, you know, this back here, this up here, this over here, then a good set of speakers should provide you with that kind of soundstage. But what's within the soundstage is also what counts. So you have, you know, vocalists, you have instruments, and you have other things going on. Where those are positioned and the focus of them, that defines imaging and focus. So if you have, you know, a singer to the left, and it sounds like it's on the left from your speakers, and that's proper imaging. Uh, if it's from the center and it's supposed to be in the center, that's proper imaging, all those things, et cetera, et cetera. And then the size of the vocalist. You know, if the vocalist was mixed and, and they sounded like they were small right on the source media, but your speakers, you know, make the vocalist sound like they're larger than life, well, that's not correct. That's, that's not accurate, and that is improper focus. Um, so overall, the imaging and focus of these speakers was really quite good, in my opinion. Very tight, uh, tight images from when they should have been tight. And the reason I determine that they're supposed to be tight images is because I run it through, you know, uh, music software, ozone, audacity, kind of get an idea of what the spectrum looks like and what the 3D sound field looks like. So I know this because I'm able to analyze the actual tracks themselves. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah, very low. So yeah, everything that I've already said is, is still here. And overall, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting speaker because of its two and a half way design. And it gives me another data point to reference for some more complex data. So I think that's cool. Now we're gonna jump back out of this. We're gonna get into the wrap up and finish everything up. So let me wrap this thing up. I'm gonna look at some of my notes that are on my website here to help me kind of refresh my memory. At 45 inches tall and 83 pounds in weight, these are pretty commanding speakers. I mean, you walk into a room and they take up some space and they command your attention. The triple eights, I mean, you look at them and you think, all right, this is going to get pretty sick. And then, then you notice the horn wave god, uh, and you think, all right, yeah, this is going to get pretty loud. And these speakers certainly do it. However, I'm disappointed that they don't go lower in frequency. As I said before, that seems to kind of be what the sound characteristics of some JBL products and the Rebel products as well do. They just don't get the extra extension that I want. But, you know, if you were to do that, then you would sacrifice SPL capability as well. And most likely, you're going to be running a subwoofer with these speakers anyway. So that's not really that big of a concern. But if you're looking for something that will cover 20 to 20, you know, just floor standards only, I hate to say it, but these speakers are not going to be it. Uh, what else do I have? Oh, overall tonality. I would put these as a good overall tonality. Again, they don't have the fidelity that the Rebel had. But overall, you know, things are pretty good. There's some certain issues that I noticed, the 300 hertz issue, the stage height issue that I noticed when, you know, just the mid range is playing and you can certainly hear that the sounds are coming from the mid woofer as opposed to the tweeter axis. And that, that bothered me, but overall, you know, I thought that for the most part, the tonality of these speakers was pretty good. You know, one thing worth noting is in general, horn designs are kind of frowned upon and I'm just going to, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, you know, getting into that. But I'll just say that if you're one of these people that looks at horn speakers and you think they're going to sound honky or shouty or, or something along those lines, these speakers do not do that. They didn't sound that way to me. And in the data, there's no indication that they would do that at all. There is, you know, about a one dB bump at around two kilohertz. 
but 1 dB is certainly not something like you're probably used to where you have a falling response above, you know, 2, 3, maybe even 1 kilohertz depending on how large the horn and the compression driver is. So a typical horn, this is not. This is a new generation horn and it's a great one. And maybe I should just say waveguide because there is a difference there. Um, what else? You know, I mentioned the imaging and focus a second ago, so I won't spend a lot of time doing that. And while we'll say that while the radiation pattern is well controlled, and, you know, plus or minus 50 degrees, it's not as wide as I would personally like it. I've already stated that before. I generally like a speaker with a wider radiation pattern, and that's pure preference. There's a lot of people that do not like a wide radiation pattern, and they like a speaker that is more narrow, more focused in the sound. And also that kind of plays into your room setup. So that's something that, you know, that's just my personal preference. These get downright loud. They, I mean, they just freaking hammer. 105 dB at four meters is absolutely nothing to scoff at. There was no mechanical noise whatsoever. And I, I can say that when you're able to crank up a speaker and not have to worry about it flopping around in the wind, that's a great feeling. And you can certainly do that with these speakers. And if you pair them with a subwoofer, you could have an incredible sounding home theater setup slash music listening setup. The relatively high sensitivity of these speakers provides some high dynamicism. I mentioned that previously, but just want to kind of recap that. Um, and I do ultimately, what I feel like these speakers are is a good mixture of movies and music. And I, I gotta say that a pet peeve of mine is when people say, well, what speakers are good for movies or what speakers are good for music? Well, the ideal speaker is good for both. But there's trade-offs, you know, when you want more SPL, you want more output, you generally require more speakers, more drive units, and when you do that, you increase complexity. And the only way to engineer the perfect speaker around all those complexities is to increase the cost significantly. But this speaker, I think, makes some good sacrifices, you know, where it needs to, and it provides you plenty of output while still providing you a very good speaker that you can listen to music on when you want to do that as opposed to just watch movies. So I think this speaker really does strike a good balance between the two. Whereas something like the Revel F226BE that I reviewed, I wouldn't say that you can't watch movies with it, but I would say that you know when you buy something like that, you're getting it for the fidelity. You can watch movies with it, but it doesn't quite have the, the output capability that this speaker had, at least in my humble opinion. So with that all stated, I'm going to wrap this up. I hope you guys appreciate it, and I hope you learned something by watching some of the data. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask in the comments below. Make sure to give it a like if you liked it. If you didn't like it, give it a thumbs down. And I know people probably are going to just hate on it anyway because people are weird like that. But I just want you to know if you leave me a thumbs down, you're still helping me out. So either way, I'm good, bro. Um, I think that's going to be it for me, and yeah. I appreciate you guys watching. Y'all take care. Peace.